Okay, uh, we shall start now. Um, today, um, sorry, can you do the next? Okay, perfect. So we had a full session yesterday um, and today uh, we will start with the hands-on task results and discussion, the hands-on task we provided you uh, yesterday. I hope you have managed to do the task and also submit the response. We saw a few of the responses online. Um, then we will follow the, the schedule given in under session two. <clears throat> so without delays, we will go into the next presentation, which is the hands-on task results and discussion. And myself, Asana and Raphael will be uh, presenting to you. So about the hands-on tasks, if you had any issues or any comments, any suggestions, any questions, you can put it in the chat box from now on. And we will have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. So the first part, I will start with the case study on URM building, the hands-on task on URM building. So, so, so this, these are the taxonomy parameters. And I will start by presenting to you what was the distribution of answers you provided uh, from your task. So the first parameter, main structural system, most of you, 80% provided that it's URM7, which is it, which, which it is, um, it's correct. Um, about the height range, it was a single story building, so low rise, oh, sorry, 1,000, no, yeah, exactly, 1,000 percent, correct. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So about seismic design level, um, most of you, it should be 80 percent, but anyway, most of you uh, decided that it was a poor design, and there was only one or two response which was low design. About the diaphragm type, uh, you almost all of you selected flexible type diaphragm, which is good. About the structural irregularities, you selected no irregularities, which is good. Uh, about the short panel and long panel, the wall panel length, uh, most of you selected large long panel, which is the correct answer. And few also selected the uh, short panel. Mm. About the wall opening, most of you selected the small opening, 70% of you, which is the correct. And also 30% about selected the large openings. About the foundation type, it was 50-50 with respect to flexible and rigid foundation, which, which is as expected. Uh, about the seismic pounding risk, most of you selected no pounding risk because this information was already given there. And some also selected there is pounding risk. About the seismic retrofitting, almost all selected original structure because this information was clearly given. Uh, about the structural health condition, most of you selected fair condition, which, which is what it looks, and few also selected poor condition, which is also kind of uh, reasonable. And finally, about the non vulnerable non-structural elements, most, uh, it was half half again, uh, about the vulnerable structures and non-vulnerable structures. So now I will present to you um, what is the actual taxonomy for this one is according to us. So this was the building given. We, we provided you some notes that said 230 mm brick in cement mortar walls, which is the URM seven category. Um, this is a single story building, as you can see. The wall panel length is uh, about five, six meters which becomes more than 12 times the wall thickness. So it's of course long panel. The openings, the total length of the openings is uh, smaller, slightly smaller than the wall panel length. Therefore it's less than 50%. Therefore it's a small opening. Uh, about the pounding risk, as you can see, but only one side anyway, there is a gap, sufficient gap uh, to approx uh, approximate buildings. About the seismic design level, where you had most of the confusions, I think I wanted to clarify this. So we explained to you in yesterday's presentation, what is a poor design, a low design, medium design, and high design. High design. So the poor design is where the, the, there are no seismic enhancement measures, such as buttresses or horizontal bands or any ties. 
and the cross wall connections are poor. That is, for example, if you have running bones just touching the, the other walls, cross walls, then the, the connection between those is only by mortar. So there is no well built cross wall connection. Okay, in that case, it would be poor design. But in our case, what we said is it's a brick masonry, English bond walls. English bond means the cross walls are well worked and they produce somehow good level of connections. So uh, all the walls are connected with English bond uh, uh, joint patterns. So that means all the walls are at least bonded somehow. So that contributes towards some level of global behavior. Therefore, there is some level of seismic design involved here, there. Uh, however, there are no buttresses, no horizontal bands. So it cannot go beyond low design. Therefore, we, we consider this building as a low design, not poor design. And the, the diaphragm type, although it looks like it has good connection to walls, but the diaphragm itself has flexibility within its plane. Therefore, we consider it as a flexible diaphragm building. As you, can, as you can see the plan shape, it's a regular plan, which is a rectangular, so no irregularities, no strengthening since it's construction, which makes it original structure. So most of you were correct about the irregularity uh, or the retrofitting uh, details. About the foundation, you had some issues, like there was half, half responses with flexible or rigid foundations. So about foundations, we gave you information on continuous footing under walls. So that makes it a strip foundation all over the walls, which provides rigid action to the, to the building, rigid connection to the building, to the ground. So that's our assumption. Therefore, for numerical modeling as, uh, considerations, we model it as a rigid foundation. Although you can argue certainly that it's a flexible foundation because it's shallow as well. So it's constructed around 20 years ago. That makes it either fair or poor condition. So we cannot see the mortar or bricks inside. It's a plastered layer. So, uh, and we, depending on how old the building is, we consider it as a fair condition, not very old. And about the vulnerable non-structural elements, we cannot see any observable vulnerable elements that can easily detach or can cause uh, economic loss or collapse. Uh, sorry, fatalities to human. So we consider generally non-vulnerable, non non-structural elements. So finally, the taxonomy string is you, you see URM7, with masonry, low rise, single story, low design, flexible type diaphragm, no irregularities, long panel, small opening, uh, rigid foundation, uh, no pounding risk, original structure, fair condition, and non-vulnerable, uh, non-structural elements. So I will pass now to Asana, who, who will present to you the confined mass on the case. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, for those who submitted the responses. Uh, it was nice to see how how clear the explanations are and how some of the, the uh, some of the things are confusing. So I, uh, similar to the URM case, we have uh, a, a breakdown of the responses here for the CM case. Um, most of the uh, elements are as expected, except again for the seismic design level. I think this calls for a little bit more um, explanation as in the case of URM and we'll go through that. So other than that, I think the, the uh, wall opening was another confusing parameter, which, um, you know, 60% uh, got wrong. Um, so there was, if you remember, we had a, a discussion on this yesterday that it's defined differently in the case of uh, CM buildings. So we had uh, uh, talked about defining the wall panel lengths that are between the confining columns rather than cross walls. So that's uh, again, a third parameter that is um, going wrong. So, um, so once we have uh, small wall panels uh, defined, we then look at the openings and their confinement. So if we have large openings without confinement, it calls for LON. Uh, which is the case uh, of this building. I think other than that, most uh, most of the things are fine. Um, so with the building we looked at was this particular building, a, sing a single block of a classroom. Um, there is uh, some of the pictures you can already see that this is a CM1 building uh, typology. Um, 
with no pounding risk because there is no uh, not very close buildings around and we have large and confined openings um, low rise single story building with respect to the low seismic uh, the seismic design level we had mentioned that you can assume good connections this was uh, just to show a difference between the example case we discussed earlier yesterday so it's it's easy to go wrong because it's hard to find what is what is the level of connection also the the sequence of construction whether they did the masonry first and then cast the rc uh, columns and beams or the other way around um, so uh, assuming that there is a good connection because there is a rough edges between the two elements we had uh, given a good connection and because there is no sill band or lindel uh, or roof band, we can uh, say that it's not more than low, low design. So why uh, this, what is the difference between the poor and low uh, is that it's mostly coming from the interfaces between the RC elements and the masonry elements. So uh, in the traditional case, we should be having, um, it, which is, uh, uh, we should be having the connections such as this, where you have uh, the masonry cast uh, erected first and then the RC columns. Uh, if that is the case, we have a very good connection, which would call for a, at least a low design. But when we don't have that kind of very, um, very stiff or very smooth interfaces, we then have no better connection. So we call it poor design. But in some cases, you can see there are rough interfaces, which we then consider as low design. Um, and in this figure, you can see that even with the presence of toothing alone, it's not sufficient. So uh, that is also to be kept in mind. So uh, the, re the remaining parameters uh, regarding the flexible diaphragms, short panels, considering that uh, in the case of CM, we had defined short panels to be uh, less than three meters of length for this uh, th thickness of the wall, which is okay in this case, if you see in the uh, plan uh, drawing here. So it's a fairly good condition or fair condition, at least if you consider also the exterior figure. So considering all that, we have the string now generated here. So I will now pass on to, uh, yeah, sorry, a few more parameters considering the original structure. I think these were directly given in the explanation. So it, it was not causing much trouble. I will now pass on, pass on to um, Rafael for RC. Thank you. Thank you, Asana. And yes, lastly, we will see the case of the reinforced concrete building. In this particular case, similarly as the others, we got a 100% of the of the good attribute for the for the main structural system, which in this case it was RC3. We also saw that all of you identified the number of stories, which is very good. Um, the seismic design level in here, we have some difference. 60% of you uh, define low design, while the other 40% uh, indicate it was a mid design. In here, we have like a particular um, condition that we will talk uh, in, in a few slides, why we should select in this case a low design seismic level. In the case of the diaphragm type, it was straightforward that it was a rigid uh, diaphragm since we have a concrete slab in this case. In terms of the structural irregularity, we have that almost all of you identified that the building has like no type of irregularity, but some of you identify a, a horizontal irregularity. We saw also some confusion in, in the parameter six in the wall panel length, in which for the specific case of reinforced concrete, we have short span and long span. In this case, the correct answer was short span, but almost all of the people who answer indicated was a long span. In relation to the wall openings, remember that when we talk about wall openings in RC buildings, we talk about the relation between the column and the beam. So in this case, 60% of the people answer regular column, while 40% um, indicate that the, that the column was weak in this case. In relation to the foundation type, we saw that 80% of people answered rigid foundation, which is expected, but of course, here's some level of uncertainty since we don't know the 
soil type. But assuming that in this case, we have um, isolated footings uh, from that were designed for, for each one of the columns, we, we feel safe to define that the foundation will be rigid. Um, seismic pounding risk was very clear for all, since all of you answered that no pounding risk was expected in here. And in relation to the seismic retrofitting, of course, it was also clear that the, that the building was the original structure and it didn't have any type of retrofitting. Um, then we have the structural health condition. Most of you indicate good condition, while 20% um, indicated fair condition. In here, there's also some like subjective um, points of view that could be like one side or the other. But what is clear is that this building is not in a poor condition. Uh, it, it is mainly in a good condition, but someone can say also it is fair. And finally, in relation to the vulnerable non-structural elements, we have that almost all the people answered that there were non-vulnerable um, non structural elements. Um, and this was clear from the pictures as we will see in the, in the following slides. So remember that the the building that we shared with you was this we can see in this building a uh, some conditions that are relevant first we have in here very clear a short column uh, effect there is no isolation as indicated also in the in the slides that we share there was no isolation between the masonry infit walls and the column elements so it is it is clear that this is an rc3 building it is mid-rise it has two stories and um, we can in here define that this is a low design since we do not have any type of consideration related to this a uh, short column in consideration or collapse mechanism so um, this this can be understood or can be concluded from the pictures in this particular case, we also had the structural drawings, and from them, we from the drawings we can see also that this is, was designed for a low for a low design hazard zone. So this is this is um, clear from from the additional information that we didn't share with you, but uh, what we can also very safely uh, conclude is that this is not a high design building or it's not a poor design building. Like we avoid both of those extremes values. Also, the building has no irregularities, and it is a rectangle in, in, in all directions, so we wouldn't have any problem in that sense. The span, in this case, we can assign a short span uh, attribute because the length between columns or the distance between columns was less than six meters, so in this case, we are in the safe side too. As I mentioned uh, before, the rigid foundation in this case was assumed. And it is also clear from the picture that there's no pounding risk. Also, it is clear that it is an original structure and the condition is good, even though someone can argue that the condition is fair, but that will not uh, modify heavily the vulnerability function. Uh, finally, from the drawings, you can also identify that in this case, we have a regular column condition. The rigid diaphragm is also straightforward uh, from the pictures and also from the construction type and the materials that are usually used in this type of buildings. And in here, we didn't see any type of bookshelves or, or ceilings that were, are not well attached. And for that reason, we um, define that in this case, we have non, no condition of vulnerable uh, non-structural elements. So, of course, this was only taken from this picture. Uh, if more pictures are available, uh, we can see with, with more confidence if there are or not, but it, it is safe in this case to, to define this. Um, now we will have a moment for questions and answers. Um, I, I, what we have seen until now are the three case studies that you that you had. Uh, some of you answer, some of you don't. But the idea in this space is to open the chat. If you want to open the microphone, you can also do it, and and we will be happy to answer any question. And I don't know if you have any question in the chat. Nothing yet.
I think that we can continue then. Okay, for, for example, in this case, the Yes, it is. Uh, but for example, we saw in here that some people were not um, like very clear if you need to assign a mid design or a low design. And I think that this also happened not only in the reinforced concrete case, but also in the unreinforced concrete case and in the confined masonry case. So if someone that answered this and didn't see like your answer, your particular answer in the in the solution, you can you can use this moment to ask why you why we consider a different condition and we can have some type of, of discussion in that sense. Up. Yeah. Uh, here it's okay. That will you consider the complete wall or the half? Because there is a wall in the middle. Yeah. So uh, to compute the percentage opening, we consider panel by panel. You consider panel by panel, um, and you consider one panel and look at the openings in that particular panel. Then we, you compute the total length of the openings, and you divide by the total panel length of that panel, and you get the percentage opening. And if it's less than 50%, uh, it will be a small openings, and if it's more than 50%, it's large. Thank you for the question, Diana. Hope that's clear. Yeah, if you have any, any further questions, for example, in the seismic design level or any, any parameter, that made you confused during the task. For what is used the wall thickness? So wall thickness has not been used in any computations in these parameters. So wall thickness indicates uh, the seismic design level somehow. Yeah. Uh, because uh, in masonry, uh, more the wall thickness, the shear resistance is better. Therefore, it, it, this parameter, wall thickness, will be uh, considered under the seismic design level. Yes, exactly. And also the slenderness of the wall, how slender the wall is, the thickness versus height. Okay, so. Thank you. Thank you, Dex, uh, for that question. Um, you ask if the ground floor is RC and the second floor is still a structural components, what is your advice? So in this here, we will have a combined structural system that is not considered in the structural system that we have shown uh, during this course. But I think that in that case, the best thing to do is to define a particular um, a structural system that contains these two materials uh, as a combination and do all the all the, all the different assessments to this new index building that that appears so what we did with this taxonomy and what you have been uh, looking uh, during this during this course was what we did for the 
buildings that are more common in the world. So that's why we are restricted to these like generic characteristics. But when you go to the particularities, you will find that kind of, of examples. And in that case, I think that you need to add that to the, to the taxonomy as new information. And, and the good thing in here is that this is like dynamic in that sense, that new, when new information comes available, it is very easy to integrate in this, in this system. Thank you. And also, um, like complementing the last question, there's another thing we have seen, like until now, the main parameters, then the secondary parameters, these compose the 12 parameters of the taxonomy system, but there are other conditions that is the, or other characteristics of each building that are the intrinsic characteristics. So in the next presentation, we will see for like why these are defined, but when we talk about the intrinsic characteristics, we talk, for example, as the geometry of the building, the particular properties of each one of the structural elements. So in that sense, all those minor details can be included as an intrinsic characteristic of a particular taxonomy uh, a string. For example, if we uh, go to a building with a very low, like with a low level of compressive strength in the concrete, then we can identify that into the intrinsic parameters and define this in the model and then obtain a vulnerability for that particular building that we are analyzing. Yeah. Is it to Dexter or for us? I think it is for Dexter. I don't know. Yeah, just ask. Maria, do you want to ask the question in opening your microphone? Yes, sir. Good evening, Paul. Uh, I am from the Philippines, and Sir Dexter is. Uh, Sir Dexter and I have the same place in Cagayan de Oro City, so that's, that's why I'm asking him if he could uh, train us further regarding this taxonomy because nobody could tell us if what we're doing is already right or wrong because this is a new uh, way of assessing our school building, sir. So can we tap Sir Dexter? For Okay, no, Dexter, do hello. You want to... Yes, <laughs> yes, go Maria. On. I think the yes. best resource persons are now here tonight. But clearly, um, Maria, uh, you're in the city, and hopefully, we will plan soon, no, to work with uh UNESCO chair for uh maybe maybe another set, no, for more of our uh, engineers in the city can join. We will we will plan that out, uh, Ma Maria. But definitely oh. the UCL, not me. <laughs> no, to, yeah, to I was just asking, sir, because we have, because they are far from us and we are okay. in the same. We will place. find a way for them. Um, yes. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you, Maria, and thank you, Dexter. Uh, I will give now the floor to Asan to answer the question sent by Diana. Uh, hi, Diana. I am P8. You mean the foundation type? Um, uh, hi. <laughs> yes, thanks. I, I didn't catch it. Yeah, sorry. So this was, um, we mentioned in the case of URM, that's why I didn't, I, uh, I didn't want to repeat. So we have uh, continuous uh, foundations below the walls for both the URM and confirmation reconstruction. So in our modeling purposes, we are considering this as a rigid foundation considering that it's um, rigid or you know stiff soil and you have a continuous foundation all around the building rather than individual footings uh, standing alone. So that is why we go for the assumption of rigid foundation. But if you are uh, going for a more detailed assessment of the foundation failures and so on, it is possible to consider this as a flexible foundation and assess settlement within the foundations. So that that is uh, uh, something to... Um, what do you say, assist your further modeling, which we'll be dealing in the next presentation. Asana, I can, I, can I have another question for you? Yeah, please. 
Yes, it's because yes, you, in the slide appears several types, several types of foundation, wall footing, isolated footing, combined footing, mm -hmm. extra beam mm -hmm. foundation. So we assume that for instance, wall footing or isolated footing are flexible uh, foundations and combined strap and rough are rigid. Those yes, who yes. Are, those who are uh, connected between them are rigid. Yeah, so this is a, a, a questionable thing. So it, it, it's not just the type of foundation that, that would decide whether the behavior is rigid or flexible. So if you have a rigid, uh, what do you say, the raft kind of, fine, kind of foundation in a very um, the soft soil, that can also become a flexible um, nature. So uh, this is, uh, first of all, this could be case specific. And also, this is uh, something to guide your modeling assumption. So if you are um, in, in our models that we're going to show you next, we are assuming that the foundations are uh, rigid so that we don't account for foundation deformations or individual or um, differential settlement. So that is the reason behind uh, this assumption. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you, Asana. Thank you all for the questions. We will continue now. Um, now that we saw all these cases and we answered some questions, we will have time also at the end if you have any other question. But with this, I just want to close the, the, this presentation. And now the next presentation will be on the fragility and vulnerability methodology and case studies. This will this presentation will be also be given by Asana Prohit and myself. So I'm going to stop sharing one moment and I will start sharing the other presentation. Okay, so the idea of the second presentation is to answer the question and try to understand a little bit how fragility and vulnerability can be derived. For the moment, until now, in this course, what we have seen is to identify main typologies, how to classify them, and at the end, obtain this taxonomy string. So I can apply this, for example, in a whole national portfolio or a regional portfolio and I can identify the several uh, unique combination of taxonomy strings but at the end what I need to do with this is then understand in the second phase I don't know if you remember but Dina told us in the first presentation that the risk is comprised by exposure vulnerability and hazard so this what we have seen until now is part of the exposure and then we can use also this information to derive then the second model um, of risk that is the vulnerability. And the vulnerability at the end, what we want to characterize is the behavior of the building when a particular hazard is increasing. So for this, in the glossing methodology, uh, we develop a particular, uh, like some particular steps to derive fragility of vulnerability functions. So this, we are going for in details for each one of these, but it start with the hazard definition. So we need to have some time history records. This, since we are talking about a seismic vulnerability, we will need to have some seismic records. Then the second step is to define the index buildings at the end, what buildings I'm going to model and I'm going to obtain um, the fragility and vulnerability. The second step, once I define the index building with the main, the secondary, and the intrinsic parameters is to model the, the buildings, to do a mathematical model, a 3D nonlinear model. And with the, that 3D nonlinear model, then we can obtain the EDPs, which refers to the engineering demand parameters. So this can be done through an incremental analysis that could be detailed or not. What we are proposing here is to do a simplified incremental dynamic, dynamic analysis, um, uh, sorry, an incremental static analysis based on the N2 method. Uh, we will explain that in, in a few slides. And then we derive this methodology into two um, possibilities. The first one is to derive fragility functions 
that could be derived building based or component based, depending on the information that you have and the amount of detail that you want to give to your analysis. Or you can derive vulnerability functions. So the fragility functions, what, what they show, and you can see in this part of the screen in here, is for each one of the damage states, what is the probability of exceeding that of exceeding that damage state for a particular hazard? So if we have, for example, three or four damage state, we will have three or four particular uh, uh, functions or fragility functions in here. So when we talk about vulnerability curves, we talk about the integration of those fragility curves, and we will have only one, one line in here that correlates the intensity measure with a mean damage ratio. So in here, we have probability of accidents, and in here, we have mean damage ratio. So we can see that these vulnerability functions can be building-based as well or component-based. When we talk about building-based uh, vulnerability functions, we can go from the fragility to the vulnerability, as we will discuss also later. Or we can do a component-based assessment in which we analyze each one of the components of the building and integrate the losses for each one of them to obtain a vulnerability for the whole building. So in the first part of the presentation, I will talk about the hazard uh, and the definition of index buildings. Um, when we talk about the hazard, uh, the, the idea or what should be done um, in a particular project is to use records that are consistent with the seismicity of each one of the regions. Um, in this particular case, we are showing, since we are not located in any particular region, we propose, and also in the glossy framework, it is proposed when, when assessments are global assessment, to use the ground motions that are proposed in the FEMA uh, P695, uh, in which they define two catalogs of ground motion, the far field ground motions and the near field. They have different characteristics, different, different PGAs, acceleration, PGB velo velocity, different distance to the source, a minimum a magnitude for each one of the records or the earthquake that generate that record. And they were also um, read in different soil types. So from now on, we will be using the far field round motions, but this is open. And at the end, if you are, for example, in a project in El Salvador, then the best thing to do is to use ground motions that are in, consistent with the seismicity of El Salvador or any, any particular region that you have. So that is what is needed for the hazard. Then we need to define the index buildings. So for this, we will identify combination of glossy taxonomies. So when we are analyzing a region, then we can identify the taxonomy for each one of the buildings in that region, and then identify the combination that repeated most and those will be our, our index buildings. And in particular, in the glossy library, you can find a several um, index buildings in which we combined a, for, for, for this project uh, some years ago, the main parameters, and we obtained different combinations for load bearing masonry buildings and for reinforced concrete buildings. So this information is available and we will show you later how to access. Uh, but what you can do at the end is just click on this link. Uh, you can also Google um, the Global Library of School Infrastructure and you will have this link directly to the World Bank page. And there is a lot of resources in there that you, can use, that you could use. And in here, we talk about these main parameters that are the first three parameters in the taxonomy. Then we have the secondary parameters as we already discussed. But in here, we added these intrinsic parameters that we talked uh, also a little bit ago. Uh, and in here, we talk about, for example, geometry of the buildings and the components of the buildings. And we also talk about the material properties. So for example, I can have two buildings with the same taxonomy, but with different intrinsic parameters. This means that, for example, a building with more classrooms, a, a building that have a different geometry in plant or, or, or something like that. Um, in particular, for the buildings that we use for the hands-on exercise, hands exercise or task, we are going to see how this can be applied and what type of intrinsic characteristics uh, are, are needed to, to define the vulnerability function. So 
As you remember, we have the URM building, which was a URM seven low rise, uh, low design level. We also have the confined masonry um, building, which is a CM one low rise, low design. And finally, we have the reinforced concrete building, which was an RC3 mid rise and low design level. So for each one of these, we need to identify intrinsic parameters. When we talk about the masonry um, or the load bearing masonry index buildings, we can identify several parameters. For example, the length or the width of the building, also the height, we can define exactly how, um, how many meters there are in this how the window openings are in for each one of these case studies. The wall thickness is also very important for the modeling and so on that related to the geometrical characteristics. But also when we talk about the mechanical properties, we can define the unit weight, the modulus of elasticity, the compressive strength, the tensile strength, the cohesion, or the coefficient of friction that is shown in this, in this slide. And similarly, for reinforced concrete index buildings, what we have in here is the elevation in each one of the sites. We know where the uh, masonry infills are and how high they are. And we also have the plant of the building in this case. We have for this also the, the structural drawings, details of, of the rivers, of the steel rubs, and all the information that is needed for the nonlinear model. And finally, um, we can define then the infill wall depth, for example, which type of bricks are used in here, if they are hollow or, or not, the particular uh, strength capacity of the, of the masonry, the columns dimension, the beams dimension, and the, con the, the compressive strength or the, of the um, yield stress of the, of the steel rivers. So with this, what we have seen is the first two steps. Now we are going to show you the next steps related to the structural analysis and the EDP calculation. And for this, I will give the word to Asana. Let's go. Thank you, Rafa. Um, so uh, if we go further into after defining the index buildings and the intrinsic parameters, we are now in a position to understand uh, how to start modeling the building. So uh, why we want to do this whole process is that for performance-based methods, we often need um, uh, methods that give you um, displacement and strength capacities in the non-linear non range. So, and it's not uh, possible, it's not uh, capable uh, by doing just, a non e uh, just an elastic analysis. So uh, one method, of, one way of doing this is a nonlinear dynamic response history analysis, such as a nonlinear time history analysis or, a, or an incremental uh, dynamic analysis. However, these are time consuming and very computationally expensive. So we propose, we use a, a simplified nonlinear static pushover analysis, um, which is known as, uh, which is part of the N2 method. So here, what we do is um, we model the structure. Uh, it can be done using a number of available uh, methods, such as the finite element or applied element methods, or even further simplified uh, modeling, modeling approaches. And uh, we use a gradually incre increasing lateral load, which, is, uh, which can also have multiple options. Uh, the purposes uh, of this presentation is to give you a gist of what is involved in deriving the fragility functions uh, from the point of defining the index buildings. And at this point, I, I would like to inform that we will be having a detailed section, uh, a session uh, or a course uh, similar to this uh, in a couple of months um, in which we will explain in much greater detail uh, on the modeling and going from the capacity analysis to fragility assessment. So. Here, uh, once we decide the pattern of loading, so we can either have a triangular pushover or a mass proportional pushover, or even a ground acceleration, uh, um, increasing ground acceleration kind of pushover. So once we do this, we, we are in a position to see the, uh, uh, the increasing capacity, uh, in the response of the building in the nonlinear range. Uh, which then uh, shows uh, corresponds to different damage levels, the, from slight to moderate to extensive and complete damage. 
so uh, now we have the, the pushover curve from the uh, numerical analysis. Uh, once we have this curve, uh, the N2 method in involves converting this uh, multi degree of freedom systems uh, pushover curve into a single degree of freedom systems capacity curve. Uh, now, so far we have been de deriving this in the base shear versus stop displacement space. We first convert that into the acceleration displacement spectral space, which is the ADR space, as you can see in the uh, in this process. And then uh, we we have this capacity curve, uh, which is the original curve, which we can then idealize into an elastic plastic curve, uh, and identify the damage states on them. The next step is to compare, uh, facilitate the comparison between the capacity and the demand, so that we have the uh, the elastic spectra of the ground motions, as uh, Rafa explained before. We bring them down to an elastic spectrum, and then have a comparison of the idealized uh, capacity curve with the spectral space. So it, it graphically directly gives us the performance point, um, and we also can identify the points. So the the whole purpose of doing the uh, this analysis. Uh, in, in this particular course is to understand what kind of uh, parameters in our taxonomy system is going to contribute to what level of fragility and then how can we improve them uh, through retrofitting. So uh, once we have those performance points, um, the next step is to um, derive the fragility functions. So this is involved uh, using some regression analysis techniques such as the least square error method. So we have the cloud of performance points uh, developed through analy analyzing the structure through increasing ground motion intensities. With uh, a regression analysis, we can then identify uh, the parameters of distribution of this fragility functions. So most of the time we, we assume a log normal distribution and the mean and standard deviation would give you the, the function. So with that, uh, we would then uh, illustrate the results of those cases we discussed before, which you have seen in the hands-on case. So first, let's explain this URM case with Rohit. Thank you. Yep. So, um, so it's, as you have seen, the methodology from numerical model, index building, numerical model uh, to capacity and fragility. We will show you the examples for the same set of hands-on task buildings you worked on. Um, and uh, so I will start with the case one on enforcement center building. As you can see, the, it's the same building you worked on uh, in yesterday's task. So this is the numerical model. We have created this model in extreme loading for structure software, a red element method. I will not go into details of that method now. Um, I will present to you first the filler mechanisms, how the building behaves on the lateral loading. As you can see, the loading direction in the long direction, uh, your out of plane walls are most vulnerable. They are almost detaching while the in-plane system is still standing with very little damage. And the similar damage pattern was observed during the 2015 earthquake, as you can see in this below two photos. When loaded in the transverse direction again, uh, there is the outer plan vulnerability of the walls, as you can see. And there is a proof of similar damage pattern from the 2015 earthquake. Now, uh, the capacity curves, the pushover curves in the uh, in the two systems, when loaded in the long direction. So we are going here with respect to component-based approach. We consider the in-plane system and we separate out the outer plane of walls as a different system. So we analyze those two systems separately. As you can see, the comparison of capacity curves, the in-plane system is almost double the strength of that outer plane walls as also supported by the collapse mechanisms you saw here. So based on the methodology, as Anna detailed to you previously, we generated, generated the uh, fragility functions for both the in-plane and out of plane systems, as you can see here. Um, so now Asana will uh, present to you the component mass on the case. So um, here, the, we use the same uh, numerical approach, uh, the applied element method using the software extreme loading for structures. 
Um, with this building, we are um, showing you the longitudinal and transverse direction loading. Um, uh, uh, it is very similar to the URM, except that in this case, we also have the in-plane walls contributing significantly into the load, uh, loading, load carrying capacity. So in this, um, in the pushover curves, I'm showing you the out of plane uh, maximum and average displacements versus the top shear, to, uh, the base shear in both the cases. So uh, you can uh, see similar damage uh, or the failure mechanism developing where the out of plane gable walls are um, uh, toppling over uh, uh, from the building in the longitudinal direction loading. Similarly, the out of plane walls in the, in the transverse loading are um, developing a out of plane bending mechanism. So why this would be different uh, if we had assigned a poor design level is shown here. So as, as we remember, we had this issue of assigning low or uh, poor design level. So in the poor, in the low design level, we had assumed that we have good connection. So before actually these uh, out of plane elements falling out of the building, they do have some uh, level of capacity to, to mobilize the in-plane capacity loads, uh, in-plane in wall capacity. But in the case of poor design, because we don't have any good connections, uh, it's it's the the out of plane portions of the walls are just uh, detaching from the building without mobilizing as much of in plane capacity. So we we stick with the, the with the condition of low design as we as we previously discussed, and then we uh, continue to develop the fragility functions. So this is a, a representation of the cloud of performance points as we discussed, and then uh, I did a least square method to derive the fragility functions as shown here. So uh, we can now discuss the RC case. Uh, sorry. So this uh, would be a. Uh, uh, an, a comparison between the two uh, cases where we have the uh, the x and y direction loading and the the black line you see is the maximum considered earthquake intensity of the region where the building is located thank you sana and last we will have this rc building that we have also developed in the taxonomy and in this case, we have a numerical model of each one of the of this index building. This was made in another software that is named Perform 3D, that maybe you are also familiar with it, in which each element was modeled by fiber, uh, by a fiber element, and the masonry infills were modeled as these uh, orange elements that you have seen, that you can see in this picture. So based on this, we obtain then the capacity curve and from the capacity curve using the incremental end to method that Asana explained a while ago and the least square method or the regression method, method that you prefer, we can then derive these fragility functions that you can see in here. So you can see that there are a, a lot of particularities for each one of, of the cases. And at the end, the result will be a, four of these fragility curves. Now we will pass to the vulnerability curves derivation. This is the last step of the methodology that is uh, presented in, in this red box um, right here. So there's one way that is a building based approach in which at the end you have a fragility um, function or a set of fragility functions for a building that was obtained as the ones that we presented above. And what we can do is to define a, the damage probability of intensity for each one of the of the intensity measures. So, for example, we can like uh, stop in this in this line and see what um, amount of of or or, or 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 percentage in here or damage probability can be assigned to each one of the damage states, and then we can convolve all those. Um, with the cumulative cost of repairing that particular damage state. So we will pass to damage uh, to a loss, loss function in which we have the mean damage factor or mean damage ratio as, as presented in here. And then we have the component based model. So in this case, we don't want to go directly from the fragilities, but to obtain a, like their own vulnerability functions. And for this, you can then develop a component model in which we can establish each one of the components in each one of the levels of the building, the structural, the architectural, and the, and the contents components. 
uh, you can assign a fragility function for each one of the components. So this is a fragility that does not refer to the building, uh, to the complete building, but just to a particular component. For example, you can see um, that this fragility is for a node between a column and a beam. This was obtained from the FEMA P68. Um, and there is a set in this document of fragility functions for several components. And it's also very important to define the cost of repairing each damage state for each one of these components. So once you do all that, then you can integrate uh, all the losses. And one possibility is to use a vulnerability functions integrator, such as Fumbul, that is available in the Capra web page. And this, at the end, what, what this program does is to integrate the losses, considering uncertainty through a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, and there's also some additional consideration that should be included, that can be included in the, this program, but are important to consider in, in any vulnerability function that you use or that you derivate. And is how do you, con how you will consider the residual drift. For example, if a building with a high residual drift, then you need to, to collapse it um, and build a new one. There's also important to define the intensity level with no significant repair cost or the maximal as acceptable repair cost for total replacement. Then you can smooth this curve and you will have your vulnerability functions. So we did this for each one of the, of the exercises that we had in which we developed the taxonomy. So in here, there is the unreinforced masonry building the taxonomy that was developed that Rohit explained us and the corresponding vulnerability function. So we can see a high vulnerability seen from the beginning and complete damage around a 1G as PGA. Then we have the confined masonry building, the one that Asana explained us. And in here we have the vulnerability function, uh, the vulnerability curve. And what we can see directly is that the curve, that this curve is much more, uh, much less vulnerable than, than the reinforced masonry, which is also expected. And finally, we have the RC building vulnerability function. This is an RC3 building, as you remember, in which short column uh, behavior is expected. And that's why the losses at the beginning of the curve are relatively low, but they start um, increasing very fast. And that's because the collapse mechanism or the short column uh, collapse mechanism is triggered at this um, at, at this level of intensity measure. And here we can see a comparison between the three. As you can see, the unreinforced masonry is the most vulnerable. Um, then we have a, the reinforced concrete building, and we have also the confined masonry. So, for example, if we compare for the same uh, for for a particular PGA, for example, 0.4 um, PGA we can see that the damages will be around 50% for the, for the reinforced masonry. If we want to get that same level of amount of damages for the confined masonry, we will need a 1.0 Gs PGA, and we will need a around 0.6 or 0.7 spectral acceleration. So this is also important to have in mind. The first two curves are in terms of the peak round acceleration, while the third one, the RC building, is in terms of the spectral acceleration for the first structural uh, mode period. So um, just to finish um, this presentation, we just wanted to remember you that all these resources are available in the Glossy um, webpage. Um, I'm going to open it very fast in here. So you can enter to that link. You will have this, the Global Program for Safer School uh, webpage. You can go to the library in which you will find the catalog of building types, taxonomy, vulnerability, vulnerability reduction solution, some tools for data collection, and some in-country data. You can go, for example, through each one of these, for example, to the catalog of index buildings, and you can open a for example, this LBM that is an Adobe low rise with low seismic design. You can see the taxonomy parameters and you can click in this link with the particular taxonomy. Um, and you will see then the details of each one of the taxonomy parameters that were selected. 
uh, definition of why this was selected. The failure modes that are common in this particular typology. And you can also see, for example, the vulnerability function, you can download it, or the index building assessment, which are some forms that were developed in the past for the global program for safer schools, in which you can find all the taxonomy parameters of each one in, of the index building, all the intrinsic characteristics of the building that was modeled, the pushover curves of each one of the models, some of the failure or collapse mechanisms, and you will have the set of ground motions that were used, the linearization of the pushover curves, the engineering, the resulting engineering demand parameters, the resulting fragility functions, and the resulting vulnerability curve. Uh, in here, you can also find some reference that are useful and that were used to develop this particular um, curve. So thank you very much. With this, I will now give the word to Rohit that will start the group, dis the group discussion on possible retrofitting solutions. So go on, Rohit. Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. You can see. Yeah, okay. So. So welcome back again. Uh, thank you very much, Rafa. So the next presentation is about the group discussion on possible retrofitting solutions for the buildings uh, that were given for the hands-on task or were sold during the presentry vulnerability competition. Um, so for this discussion, we will do some focused group discussions um, and we will provide structural information and vulnerability assessment results that we showed previously to you uh, in this presentation, and we will consider the same three buildings, uh, one each for each of the three breakout rooms. Um, so one for URM, one for confirmation, one for our reinforced concrete case. Uh, and please uh, join the breakout room uh, that is more interesting to you, or you want to participate in the discussion, or uh, if you are left, we will assign you to one of the rooms. So no worries. And here are some prompts for the discussion. So, so what? Yeah, the, it's open now. I can choose. Um, what is going here? I will move. Okay. So I will briefly uh, tell you about the prompts that are good for starting in setting the discussions. So which taxonomy parameters need more attention to respond to and why? How can we improve the seismic resistance? And what level of retrofitting? Is it local wall level or column level or uh, does the building need a global level of intervention? And what is the resulting taxonomy string after the retrofitting? How we can see the difference in the taxonomy string after the retrofitting? Um, please, please, please select yeah. the room you want to participate uh, in the discussion. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yes, 
we give you a few moments to, to uh, select your room. Let's choose and Hello everyone, if you are still here, it will be uh, great if you select one of the of the breakout rooms. There is one yes. called URM um, in which Rohit will explain the Umri for the masonry. The other one is the confined masonry uh, in which Asana will explain and we talk about the confined masonry. And in the RC room, I will talk about the particular case for the reinforced concrete building. So select one, please, or if not, we will, we will assign you directly. Join. There are still fourteen people who have not uh, joined one of the groups. Please. Yes. Let's give them two minutes, Rohit, and yeah. then I will assign yes. them direct. You can go. You can go to the reinforcement room. Yeah. Room now. I will lift it.
Uh, hello everyone, um, this is Asana here. I think there was a, a problem with uh, joining the meeting, me uh, the rooms. I think all the people who here are uh, are uh, have chosen the CM room and they were not able to join. So sorry for the trouble if you were um, having any technical issues. So now that we're in the main room, we'll continue the sessions as we have planned, and we can have a discussion in the end if you if you miss the CM session. Thank you. So welcome back all to the main session. We will have a short five minutes break and then we will come back with the with the following presentation. Um, we, we are we are sorry that we have some inconvenience in, in some of the rooms, but but uh, please go take some water, some coffee, and I'll see you in a moment. Thanks.
Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome back after a very quick uh, break. Um, so now we we move towards next presentation, which is connected to the previous presentation. Uh, we are dealing with the vulnerability reduction solutions again, but we will start a discussion on the outcome of the group, uh, the breakout room discussions. So for the URM uh, retrofit case, we had a discussion and there were very good suggestions on retrofitting of URM case uh, from different participants. For example, reducing windows or making the windows away from, from the ends, which is not really practical in already constructed buildings. Uh, and it will involve intr intrusive uh, destructive measures as well. Uh, another was openings can be reinforced, like confinement around the openings. Another option was given voids mess uh, in the walls. Another option was roof level bands. Uh, another was layered belts. And there were some other solutions such as span length reduction, introducing cross walls, which is not so practical in schools because we need larger classrooms. Uh, another solution was RC jacketing. Another was to introduce rigid type diaphragms to improve the global response. And there was further suggestion about low cost insulators or energy dissipators. So that was a good discussion. Now I will show you some examples of retrofitting. For example, this is RC jacketing, all on URM buildings, RC splint and bandage, RC uh, PP bands jacketing, uh, RC band beam at roof, uh, as well as roof strengthening, which is not really effective seismic strengthening. So about this RC roof band beam, uh, this needs the roof to be taken out and then reinstalled after the introduction of these RC bands. And this is possible. This has been done practically in countries such as Nepal. So that option we are selecting in this, in this presentation to show you how the retrofitting improves the taxonomy, uh, improves the vulnerability uh, of your school building. So here, um, so I will first tell you what the introduction of this, this retrofitting does in the building. So the tax, the building type doesn't change, low rise doesn't change. So it will improve the design level of the building. So it will it will progress your building towards medium design level because the global behavior is improved. And further, your original structure parameter will be now changed to retrofitted structure. Um, sorry, yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. That, that's a repetition. Okay. So this is the failure mechanisms of your original model, original structure and retrofitted structure. As you can notice, there is no global behavior in the original structure. Your outer plane walls are collapsing while the in plane wall got no much damage. And in, in case of retrofitted structure, you can see there is global behavior with in plane damage only. The out of plane failure modes are controlled. Now I will show you the comparison of capacity curves. In the original building, the in plane and out of plane systems the outer plane system is so weak, okay? When you retrofit the outer plane and in plane systems are almost of similar capacity. So that suggests it has a global behavior. Now I will show you the comparison of vulnerability functions. Those are the same hazard parameters we discussed previously for retrofitting solution. Before the retrofit, your, your mean damage ratio was about 0 0.25 to 50, 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, that is 25 to 50%. After retrofitting, you reduce down, you take down the mean damage ratio uh, towards almost around 10%. So, so that your building is now within the immediate occupancy level under the given hazard. So that's how we make use of the quantified, the vulnerability or fragility functions to guide us towards retrofitting. And this shows you how the taxonomy also helps uh, in this process of strengthening. Okay, thank you. Now we move towards confinement Sunday. So um, regarding the, the breakout room with, for confinement Sunday, we had a, 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 a small group. I am sorry that others were not able to join for some technical issue. Uh, we had uh, discussed uh, possible ways of retrofitting or improving the performance of the building we saw. 
some of the things that came up was uh, the uh, ferro cement or GFR, GFRP overlays, which has been attempted in some countries, um, in, a, at least in the laboratory uh, scale. And this uh, method such as wire mesh or the ferro cement, this has been done in real cases in some of the projects we have previously worked on. Um, uh, other things such as the reinforced concrete short grating on, on the ground level to improve the shear capacity of the walls is an option. Uh, so one of the one of the suggestions that came out was uh, to confine the openings and also to improve the level of confinement in the whole building. So this is something that we attempted in in the numerical modeling. Uh, it is it can also be considered as a as a um, as a retrofit of this particular building. And there are uh, existing buildings which have this much level of confinement uh, in the original state itself. So uh, considering these uh, the additional bands at the roof level and sill level as a, as a measure of improving the seismic performance of the uh, building. We then look at the failure mechanism. So we, if we remember that this had a local out of plane uh, mechanism. And now with the better confinement, we see that it has a much more, much better global behavior where uh, the, the in-plane walls are developing shear and uh, sliding cracks and the out of plane deformations are controlled. And we see a, a significant change in their capacity. And again, the fragility functions, when, when we go from original to this retrofitted building, we see how much of this probability of exceeding the moderate damage level is uh, improved uh, or uh, reduced. Uh, and similarly, when you compare the vulnerability function. So we now have the building within the expected uh, level of performance, as we see in the URM case. Uh, we can now discuss the RC example. Thank you, Sana. Yes, and finally, the RC example, what we discuss in the group is several different retrofitting options. For example, a steel bracing, a concrete walls, a building, or uh, some type of concrete buttresses. At the end, what we define or what we saw is that masonry infill walls should be isolated from the structure to avoid the rainforest the short column effect, but also the resulting frame now with the building, with the masonry isolated, it needed to be um, retrofitted. And these are the three possibilities that we suggest. So as you remember, we have this um, taxonomy for this particular building. We define the capacity curve and the vulnerability curve in the current condition. And we can see that the structural deficiencies are short column, low stiffness, weak floor that could be generated due to the short column and a strong beam and weak column mechanism. So therefore the three possible or retrofitting alternatives are steel frames in the first story. Uh, in this case, we are looking also for a steel frames in first and second stories. And the third option is a concrete shear wall in first and second story. So, Graphically, you can see the building like this. This is the steel braces in the first story only. So you can see them in here in both um, sides of the building. And you can see now that the taxonomy string will change. Now we have an RC4 building, not an RC3. The design level is also improved and the retrofitting structure uh, that previously was original structure. Now it's a retrofitted structure and that should be also modified. For the second um, retrofitting possibility, we included this additional frame in the second uh, story. And now we have a high design building instead of a mid design. And we also analyze this reinforced wall in here or, or buttresses or reinforced concrete buttresses in which we have the same seismic taxonomy as for the previous retrofitting alternative. And when we see this into the vulnerability, we can see, for example, that the first um, two taxonomies are not the same. One is for mid design, while the other is for high design. And this is also a clear from the different vulnerability functions. You can see in red, the original one, and in green, the retrofitted. You can see that some reduction with the first alternative, but a greater solute reduction for the second alternative. And you can see that the, that the taxonomies for these two uh, last alternatives are very similar and therefore also the vulnerability is very similar as you can see for these two vulnerability cubes in the retrofitted condition. 
So with this, we finish this part of the presentation. And now I will give the word to Juan Carlos Atoche, who is a learning and infrastructure specialist at the World Bank. And he will talk a little bit about the next step, that is how Glossy can be used for disaster risk management and non, not only for taxonomy or vulnerability, um, as we, we have seen until now, like the next step of this process. So Juanca, please go on and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. And thank you for having me. Uh, I will share my screen. Are you seeing my screen? Not yet, Juanca. Uh, it, will come. it will come, yeah, but not yet. Okay, please, one moment. Now, yep. now we can see it, Juanca, please. Great. And in, in this part, I will provide a different point of view of the Glossy application. I will describe its relevance in terms of disaster risk management policy formulation. As you know, at the global level, several crises are affecting to be, um, are affecting governments, their priorities and their infrastructure needs. Governments will continue to be under intense fiscal pressure as they rebuild their finances, which will severely constrain future resources for public infrastructure investments. On the other side, infrastructure investments are subjected to increasing levels of complexity as is being called upon to meet multiple objectives and to deliver multiple benefits in the short and long term. For the coming years, countries should invest a scarce scarce resources in a smart and a strategic way to produce learning-oriented, resilient, inclusive, and sustainable schools. To get there, we should improve the way of doing investments um, through institu institutionalization, planning, formulation, and materialization. After our technical assistance in Central America, the Global Program for Safer School is formulating an investment framework to provide strategic orientations to improve the quality of school infrastructure in these challenging times. Those orientations will guide decision makers and practitioners through four components and 13 subcomponents of the investment process. Those orientations are key to warranty the delivering of value of to students and their communities. Strategic orientations go from early stages started with policy design up to operational stages dedicated to maintenance, for example. In this framework, disaster risk management is integrated in each component and subcomponent. Glossy has a relevant role in the design of public policies, the identification of needs, and the conceptual design of investment programs. Modern public administration is result-oriented, and GLOSI has a relevant role in terms of the formulation of disaster risk management policy. The main message is, GLOSI is key to generate quantitative evidence during disaster risk management policy formulation. And this is a must to reach a positive impact in the quality of DRM policy implementation. In the formulation phase of DRM policies, policy justification, policy logic, and policy feasibility are factors that influence and determine the implementation phase. I will elaborate on this. A policy should respond to a need Ideally, the analysis of the need and the resulting choice of policy options should be evidence-based. Glossy offers a comprehensive and innovative way to generate a strong justification of a policy. 
For instance, in El Salvador, GLOSI was relevant to identify risk metrics, which were used in combination with other metrics to justify a national policy to improve learning environments. With this justification, school infrastructure got a position in the strategic investment plan of the Ministry of Education. This was very relevant. In Latin America and the Caribbean, most of the government don't consider the improvement of school infrastructure as a strategic objective in these five-year investment plans. If school infrastructure is not there, financial resources won't be available to implement relevant reforms. The clarity of the policy logic, I mean goals, target, and causal theory, and the priority of goals in the policy regulations impact the operational stage in the implementation agencies. Glossy's offers a robust and transparent way to define goals and their prioritizations. For instance, in Dominican Republic, Glossy was key to provide priority goals to start a seismic risk reduction program. With this prioritization, the Ministry of Education, MINER, got the baseline to move forward in the short term, reducing seismic vulnerability following a cost-effective, efficient way. The origin and the rationale of a policy and the extent to which decision makers take into account the practicalities of implementation all affect whether and how a policy gets implemented. Glossy use a set of, of parameters that are easy to communicate during implementation phase. For instance, in Peru, the investment program Plan Lima was implemented targeting a specific group of school buildings built before 1970. The taxonomy identified during the formulation phase was easy to understand by the technical teams at the project implementation unit. In this next slide, you can see the results uh, of these applications. In this slide, you can see the project in Peru. This is a small, or this is a, one project of a group of projects as part of the National Plan of School Infrastructure in Peru. Uh, in this project, the Plan Lima project, 20 million dollars were invested to benefit 265,000 students. The program was oriented to improve the quality of school buildings built before 1970s. As you can see, um, between 2016 and 2020, the government was focused in the demolition phase and the uh, installation of temporary classroom. Right now, the government is preparing the detailed designs for the new schools called Bicentenario Schools. In El Salvador, this is the last example, the glossy was used to define a uh, baseline of seismic risk. With, with these seismic risk metrics, combined with poverty metrics, enrollment, enrollment metrics, and overcrowding matrix, the government decided to prioritize, prioritize a group of schools facilities to implement their policy called Growing Up Together. This policy is focused to support early childhood development and another a strategic project called My New School. My New School uh, aims to promote innovative learning and to strengthen the community integration. Thank you for this time, and I hope uh, you can um, you can take advantage of this different point of view of us. Thanks. Hi, hello, everybody. And um, thank you very much, Juan Carlos, for the very interesting presentation. I wonder if there is any uh, body that uh, wish to make some uh, quick uh, comments or ask any question to Juan Carlos. This is a rare opportunity. Any comment from the audience?
So my particular question to Juan Carlo is whether this, thank you very much for the overview of how glossy can be used to determine the, uh, and to underpin both, uh, let's say investment policies, but also decision-making at the time of implementation. Um, could you actually uh, maybe tell us um, how these different experience that you have identified uh, are actually, um, let's say, uh, recorded and analyzed in order to move to the next phase or improve the way in which uh, the, the, how we learn lessons, in other words. Uh, yeah, um, in terms of lesson learned, I think um, the, this past seven years um, has shown that it's very important to, to have a good quality of field inspections, uh, a strong technical capacity on the local teams, and especially, I, I, I will say that it's important to transfer the knowledge from our side to the, the local side because of, of in the implementation of this technical assistance and now financial operations, there is a gap in terms of knowledge. And, and, and I think the, the glossy is um, interesting an innovative uh, um, product, um, perhaps we can improve the, the way that we transfer this knowledge to our counterparts to get a good under, under, understanding and to move forward in an efficient implementation of, of, the, of the conclusions that we can extract in these in these processes. Thank you very much, um, Juan Carlos, for this uh, answer to my question. And indeed, we hope that with the UNESCO chair and with the activity that we are um, developing with these courses, we do manage to make uh, successful knowledge transfers to uh, um, colleagues in uh, countries where there is need for improvement of the school infrastructures and that we can support them with uh, these uh, uh, tools and information so that that process can become uh, more efficient. Um, talking of efficiency, we know that there is basically, we are one minute over at this point, and I still need to go through through um, a few more slides. So I would just like to, again, uh, uh, thanks Juan Carlos for uh, his presentation and move on with a very swift summary of the course as we presented over the past two days. So you have, we have looked yesterday at the overview of the global program for safer school and how the glossy is connected to the uh, global program for safer schools. Um, we also looked at the exposure and vulnerability uh, concept in disaster risk management and how those concepts are fundamental to understand the resilience of the school infrastructure and how that resilience needs improvement. And we have mainly been talking about uh, buildings in these, uh, uh, in these um, two days, but we shouldn't uh, uh, forget the human component, the people that are actually using this building. Um, we have then looked in detail of the uh, seismic taxonomy system at the parameters, and I hope that through the examples that we have shared with you yesterday and through the exercise and the feedback and discussion that we have today, you have managed to better understand this, uh, how we use this 12 parameter to identify recurring typology across the uh, globe. Uh, we have also seen the important nexus between the exposures and the building that we see uh, in the field and what, that, what their characteristic and constructions uh, details means in terms of fragility and vulnerability. We will do much 
uh, we will do a more uh, in-depth course about this in uh, September um, on one end to better understand the analytics of deriving fragility and vulnerability functions, but also understanding what is the value of them and how they can be used. Also today we touched very briefly on structural retrofitting of school buildings and uh, B, uh, we have seen that uh, how actually true understanding the deficiency and the issue of uh, deficiency in design of the build of the existing building that we have, we can better understand how we can retrofit them and using tools such as the fragility and vulnerability functions, we can then understand what improvement we are making to these buildings in terms of their resistance to um, resistance to uh, seismic actions. Um, I have now very briefly want to speak a minute about the following uh, steps um, that uh, we will uh, cover in future. Okay. Um, in future time, sorry, there was a problem with uh, the uh, slides not moving. So yesterday we have seen that uh, the, um, the roadmap to safer and resilient schools, and we have seen what are the connection between glossy and the roadmap, and the fact that uh, in particular, we answer to point one and uh, four and five in terms of uh, defining the uh, risk and resilience, and also the issue about number six interventional strategies. Um, but there are other elements that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, uh, Karina mentioned uh, and touched upon as uh, uh, the structural and functional resilience of schools uh, um, beyond uh, the simple element of the structural safety. And this is something also that is now well entrenched in the uh, GADRES uh, um, framework uh, for uh, safer schools, uh, the global framework for safer schools. So one of the projects that we have started recently with uh, in collaboration we unset Nepal and uh, Tribhuvan University is to look in at the school infrastructure in a more holistic way, considering also functionality and sustainability, and therefore considering various uh, parameters that can uh, uh, better understand that can help understand us how the space that are built are not are not just safe with respect to earthquake but are also user friendly and allow better uh, education um, in that respect a number of uh, 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 ROIT has been recently to Nepal and collected data on a number of schools, some of which have been, were, uh, have been rebuilt after the earthquake in 2015 and uh, looked at their, uh, their uh, new uh, um, construction, whether it complies with a uh, new uh, national uh, earthquake um, standards and codes, um, and what are the functionality aspects of it, and also how the retrofit is working, is going along. One other issue that we are, we are keen to understand is how we can ensure the minimization of disruption of education. And this is also something that Karina mentioned yesterday, following a natural hazard. So in this case, we are looking at a project in uh, Cagayan de Oro in the Philippines in collaboration with our uh, colleague from uh, Xavier University. Some of them are online now. And we want to look at the nexus between the uh, school infrastructures and the road network and what happens in the immediate aftermath of an event and how we can mean for instance a flood or indeed an earthquake and how can we can minimize that period of time between the event and the uh, what we call recovery the uh, return to normalcy what are the alternative measures, not necessarily uh, structural that we can 
put in place in order to uh, make sure that students don't lose days of school or don't lose uh, days of education. And we are doing that with using artificial intelligence and intersecting uh, two different approaches, the Bayesian network and the agent-based approach in order to better uh, understand how uh, the two systems, i.e. the road network and the school infrastructures work, but also how they are used by the community and how the community interacts with them before and after an event. So watch this space and uh, there will be soon some output in relation to this. A third project that we are working on is the, uh, um, the uh, a project on decision making frameworks. So Raphael has mentioned this uh, in some of the comments. So the idea here is to understand better how choosing different reinforcement strategy uh, can improve the overall uh, school infrastructure system. This is something that, are, that becomes very meaningful when we look at the global scale or when we look at the regional scale for a nation to decide where to apportion money. So we are looking at ways in which we can identify different building typology across a large portfolio, understand what are the constraints from the financial constraints and how we can best allocate those resources in order to uh, optimize the uh, level of intervention so they, we can increase resilience by improving the quality of the uh, building that are already there in existence. Again, this is a project that, as Raphael has mentioned, is uh, pursuing in his PhD, which is uh, hopefully soon to be completed and uh, it will be, uh, in fact, it's already under uh, publications uh, in uh, journals, so you might soon see, uh, soon see some uh, interesting outcomes. Um, finally, just to remind you about the future courses that we intend to run, so we will have a pause in August. Um, today in London is 40 degrees and hopefully it will not continue like this, but you know, has been a challenge to be able to deliver this in the last two days, given the uh, temperature. For some of you, these are not uh, super uh, high temperature, but here we are totally unequipped to deal with them. Um, so we, we will come back in September, possibly with more, uh, let's say, North European uh, climate and uh, deliver the uh, engineered based vulnerability assessment uh, that I mentioned. There will be an interesting talk in October about uh, an, a different platform from Capra, but similar that is called OASIS that many people in uh, insurance and reinsurance use to determine the risk assessment uh, at uh, a global level. And again, it's determine uh, financial investment in that space. So that would be a complete different element. But then you can see that the uh, other four uh, courses that we are planning, they are very strictly related to some of the things that we discussed um, today, but also to this uh, new project that we are developing uh, with the Philippines. Uh, finally, you will find some information uh, and reference here, both for further reading of the things that have been discussed uh, and have been presented today. If you want to deepen it, please go on the Glossy website, but also there are a number of um, paper and learn journal that uh, in further uh, in provide uh, greater depth from a technical engineering point of view, uh, but also other uh, references that we have used uh, throughout. And with this, unless there are there is any uh, further questions or comment, uh, we would like very much to uh, thank you on, for your attendance on behalf of the whole UNESCO chair team. And uh, thank you again for uh, um, participating in this course. And we look forward to hear from you either through emails or visit us on our website or um, send us uh, other type of connection. Thank you very much and uh, very nice for you to be here today. Thank you.
and a big applause to all of you for the presentation. Um, we are happy to, I know that we have run out of time, but we are happy to take any comment or further discussion if uh, anybody wants to open their mic. Are there any open seats course memories uh, that we can download? Um, I will, uh, if you can send us a, a, an email about that, we will put you in touch with the uh, open seats group and uh, they will be able to uh, send you those that documentation. So you can also say goodbye to her. Can you see the slides? Huh? Yes, I'll say goodbye to her. What is it? The slides. Uh, yes, yes, we will send the slides uh, tomorrow or later today or tomorrow once we have finalized and also the recording will be available. Um, they will be uh, available on, um, there will also be a link on our website uh, that you can directly and come, come. hello yes uh, i just want to ask a question uh, yes. hi when, murula uh, hello it was nice to listen uh, your presentation thank you all of you uh, when i uh, see uh, you uh, you perform the uh, dynamic analysis of masonry buildings I want to ask, did you apply increasing acceleration based on the structure when you make analysis? Say it again, please. Uh, when you apply pushover analysis in masonry, unreinforced masonry structure, you applied increasing acceleration to base of the structure? Yes, exactly. Yes. As we discussed in, the, in, the, in Oslo. Uh huh. I just uh, I am very curious about. Did you compare these results with incremental dynamic analysis? As you know, uh, if we use uh, far field and near field ground motion data, the res responses are going to be different. Mm -hmm. Is your results near to far field, uh, near to far field result or near field result? Did you make this comparison? Uh, yeah, we, we made a comparison with far field ground motion set. Mm -hmm. and they were uh, uh, relatable, like they were matching well within the bounds. Mm -hmm. I have not uh, done the comparison with respect to near field ground motions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It, it was just interesting to me and just I want to ask. Yeah, for, with far field uh, motion set, yeah, it, it worked well, yeah. Uh, did you select the special uh, ground motion data set from FEMA? I used from FEMA P695, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nurla. If there are no other comments, then thank you. Thank Bye, you everybody, and thank you, thank you for attending. Keep in touch. You again. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice Bye, thank you. break. Bye-bye. Thank you.